Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event, Servant Leadership, Hiring Those Who Served. It is wonderful to be with you on this National Hire a Veteran Day. Thank you so much for voting with your time and for being with us. Uh, this is sure to be a motivating, educational, and inspiring hour. Whether you already have a dedicated hiring program for military-connected talent thriving at your organization, or you've joined us today looking for tips to start one of your own, I guarantee there is something for everyone here today. My name is Rochelle Chapman, and I have the pleasure of leading the ADECO Group's Military Alliance Program, our 20-year military recruitment, retention, hiring, and education program for military connected talent. I'm also a proud Navy spouse and your MC for today. Please note that today's event will be recorded. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the comment section. We'll be sure to follow up with you after the event today. We have a spectacular lineup of guests. I am so excited to hear from all of the companies that have joined us here today, and I will be introducing them throughout today's event. First up, United States Air Force Staff Sergeant Retired, Johnny Yellick II. When I was building the agenda, hi Johnny, uh, for today's program, I didn't know I needed a Johnny, but now I can't imagine hosting this event without him. His military family uh, record of service is impeccable. His own military service, which you'll hear a little bit about today, uh, is one that embodies sacrifice, uh, courage, uh, and humility. Mediocrity has never been on Johnny Yellick's agenda, but we are so blessed that he's on ours today. Hi, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Rochelle, Ladies and I'm gonna gentlemen, start keeping John. you around is my official elevator pitch. <laughs> You're too kind. I appreciate the uh, the kind words and uh, really set the tone here for me to to try to deliver. You set a high bar, and I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to achieve it. All right. You will. I have no doubt. Thanks, bud. But first of all, thank you, uh, Rochelle, and uh, representing the Adeco Group uh, for your you know, commitment to making this a priority, to seeing the value of veterans and what they contribute to business and society and wanting them to be a part of your businesses uh, on this National Hire a Veterans Day. Um, couldn't be more blessed to be here, to be able to share a little bit of my story, hopefully give you a little bit of perspective um, and maybe give a little insight into uh, the lives and perspectives, passions of fellow veterans out there uh, either already in the workforce or uh, soon to be transitioning out of the military. Uh, so again, thank you, ADECO Group. Thank you, Rochelle, for putting this together. Uh, and I will kick it off like I do. Most of my speaking engagements, I like to start where probably all of you started, which is with your parents. Uh, both of my parents were military. My dad did 27 years in the Air Force. My mom did 20 years as well in the Air Force. My mom was a radio and television broadcaster, uh, so she got to be a lot more comfortable than I am speaking to a camera as we are today. My dad was a crew chief working on F-4s during Vietnam, F-15s uh, during Desert Storm, and uh, again, retired after 27 years. So me and my sister got to be born and reared all over the world. She was born in Germany. I was born in the Netherlands. Uh, we lived in Iceland for a short time, two years as a kid, and then grew up mostly in San Antonio, and uh, in high school, we moved up to uh, Fort Worth, Dallas, Fort Worth area uh, whenever they both got out of the service. So when I graduated high school, I went to college and, you know, I graduated in 2002. So I had watched everything unfold with 9-11 uh, in 2001. And though I was motivated to respond there, I grew up in a household where it was the only option was to go straight to college, get your degree and go out into the workforce. Uh, so whether that was joining the military after college or going off and getting a, uh, a nine to five job, I had to get a degree. Check that box for the parents. And uh, while I was there in college, I got a degree in manufacturing engineering. I worked, I did a, an internship. 
for about eight months and I loved the job. I had passion wrapped in the job of what I was doing all the while in 2006 was watching what was going on in the rest of our world. And I could not, I could not not respond to what I was watching, what was going on in Iraq. And by the time I had graduated and walked across the stage and took that diploma, I basically handed it to my parents. I recognized that achieving that diploma was something that my parents wanted me to do. It wasn't something that I was passionate about. It wasn't something that made me proud. So I knew that I wanted to go and do something that I could be proud of myself for accomplishing. I saw what it, what types of success uh, and values it allowed my parents to pour into my sister and I growing up. And I wanted that for my life. I wanted that to be my platform springboard to the rest of my life. Uh, as an American. So I made the choice to do a job very differently than my parents. I chose a job called Combat Control. It's Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, and, you know, I won't go into to everything that we do, but uh, what it does is has a two year long attrition process of schools where we travel around the country going to different schools. Uh, all the while, they're trying to, to throw enough on our shoulders that we uh, that we are ultimately tested because we need the best to be able to go and represent our nation and fight for our freedoms abroad. So at the end of a two year long process, we started with about 36 guys. And at the end, we had only four of those that started actually became a combat controller. So a combat controller is uh, an air to ground liaison behind enemy lines for special operations components. So my job is to have a big radio on my back, a couple of radios on my chest, and to be able to multitask and communicate with the ground scheme maneuver, the Army Special Forces teams or Navy SEAL teams on the ground, and be able to relay the ground scheme maneuver to the pilots flying overhead to be able to drop ordnance uh, on nouns, people, places, or things. Um, so in order to get there, you have to you have to go through quite a crucible. So the end of two years, become a combat controller. Uh, that would start another year of training before we're deployable. In 2010, I went on my first deployment to Afghanistan, northern Afghanistan, in uh, Masri Sharif in Kanduz. My job was combat search and rescue. And every night I would watch on the screen as tier one assets would engage enemy threats. And my job was that if anything uh, should happen to them, that we would take action and pick up where they left off. That's a pretty vague uh, uh, explanation of, of what we were doing, but I would say my first deployment was anticlimactic. Uh, what it did was bring the battlefield home to my family because in a matter of 13 days, two of my best friends were killed in combat and my parents being back home went to both of their funerals in my stead. When I got back from my first deployment in November of 2010, uh, we have a one-to-one -one dwell ratio. So six months on, six months, six months off. So six months later, I was back on a plane to redeploy to Afghanistan, this time doing uh, village stability operations attached to an Army Special Forces team or an ODA. So I was going to get the chance to uh, defend our country in the way that I've been training to do for the last four years of my life, uh, running and gunning with the team and kicking indoors and being able to uh, provide all of all that your tax dollars have poured into me. I was prepared to uh, provide that on the battlefield. So. I got to my team late, late June of 2011, and our job was to uh, integrate with, um, with local Afghan local police, uh, indigenous forces to be able to train and equip them to be able to uh, keep themselves safe whenever America would eventually pull out of the war. And I was on my seventh day, July 6, 2011, that we were going out to a village and a checkpoint to check on on uh, Afghan local police officer resources and as we did every day. And we started to pick up inner team communication from the enemy that they were watching us. They knew how many vehicles we were in and they were wondering if we were going to stop or get out of the vehicle. My job as a combat controller is to ride in the back of the truck. I want to be outside. These are large vehicles, up armored vehicles. If I'm inside, it feels like I'm in a submarine and I don't have very good situational awareness of what's going on in the ground scheme maneuver. So I want to be in the back. 
I want to be able to see as much as I can see. And I'm not taking a, taking a tiger snooze back there. I have my pen and paper out. Um, I'm noting possible points of origin where enemy contact could come from. So I'm writing things down all the while. Uh, in case something should happen, I would be able to re respond as quickly as possible. And as I said, we started picking up uh, the chatter from the enemy. Uh, my interpreter sitting next to me in the bed of the truck is telling me what is going on. I'm relaying that to the team leader inside. We're riding in a three vehicle convoy and we are in vehicle two. The first vehicle comes up to a, a wadi, which is a dried riverbed, large riverbed uh, that went down about 15 feet, maybe maybe 30 meters long, and then up another 15 feet on the other side. First vehicle made it across, set up in a security position, and allowed the second vehicle to start to traverse the Kalat, or the uh, ravine. As we started to come up and out of the other side of the um, of the trench, that's when um, I leaned back, put my hands on top of the turret, and the IED went off underneath the bottom of, of the rear axle of our vehicle, disabling the vehicle and causing significant damage to both of my legs. When I opened my eyes, I could see nothing but the orange haze of the displaced Afghan moon dust, we call it. I could smell and taste the chemical noxious taste of homemade explosive device, as well as the diesel fluid that was pouring out of the vehicle. And as I sat up, I've now been flipped up on top of the turret and I'm looking down and I can see uh, the bottoms of both of my feet looking back up at me and I was losing blood into the cabin. Uh, Yama, my interpreter, was unconscious in the floorboard and I put my helmet back on with my headset and began to relay what I could see. Uh, so I told the team leader inside that I don't see any activity in the village to the southeast. Enzo has a broken leg um, and I've got two broken legs and I need a medic. And you can imagine that fourth uh, phrase was probably a little bit more heightened uh, than how I'm regurgitating it to you right now. Uh, and I may have repeated it a couple of times, but uh, the message was loud and clear. The medic was already on his way with the EOD and the dog to sweep for additional mines. Um, by the time the medic made it to our vehicle, and started rendering aid to my legs. Um, put, I had to put two of my own tourniquets on one of my legs. He put another one on the other. We stopped the bleeding. Enzo is fine. He had a broken leg. Uh, that would start the hour long process before a medevac would strap us to a vehicle and remove myself and my interpreter uh, to a safer place. Um, from there, uh, we would be uh, put in a coma and flown to Bagram Air Base before a seven day process of moving us back to the States. As soon as I made it back to the States, um, I would start, you know, I had no clue what I was embarking upon, um, but I was surrounded by incredible people and family, but it, I would be there for, well, by the time I got to, to San Antonio where I would be for the next two and a half years, I'd already had seven surgeries on my legs to keep them in place. And by the time I was discharged from the military, I'd had 28 surgeries on both of my legs uh, through a process called limb salvage to be able to keep them from amputation. Uh, the end state is that both of my ankles are forever fused in place, so my feet will never move. But thanks to the, the innovation and in technology that always comes after and through war, uh, we've come up with incredible opportunity of a, a certain type of leg brace, which allows me to do everything I could imagine doing. I still scuba dive, skydive. Uh, I'm able to run. You know, the doctor said that I would never run again, be lucky to walk. I'm able to run, but, you know, to be honest with you, I don't think anybody, any of us should be running anyways. I think that we all do it poorly and uh, it's not good for any of us. I think Usain Bolt has got that covered. We can just watch him. The rest of us should speed walk and, uh, you know, just try to find safer ways to burn our calories, but not taking that away from anybody. But for me, uh, just know that today and now it's been 11 years since since I was injured in Afghanistan. Uh, today, I'm, I'm doing great. 
I have no pain. Uh, I'm blessed again by the medical staff, the friends, the family, uh, and everyone that uh, descended upon me and, and surrounded me with the support that I needed to be able to transition out of the military and to where I am today, which is exactly what we're here to talk about today, right? To talk about what that transition looks like. And for me, I get to say that I had a phenomenal transition. I think that the way that I transitioned was perfect. Unfortunately, I don't recommend that for anybody. I don't recommend a uh, severe injury and then a two and a half year long process of reintegration into society and out of the military and then into the business world. So um, luckily we're joined today by a lot of resources that are gonna uh, shed some light on how to seamlessly do this uh, transition and the value that there is in for organizations and businesses to incorporate, to hire, uh, and to retain veteran talent. And that includes their spouses as well. So just like I say that the transition that I went through was phenomenal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I also get to, to say that being wounded in Afghanistan was the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life because it changed everything. It changed my perspective. Um, I worked for four years to become the tip of the spear to be able to support you, the American people, and uh, provide safety and security for those that we support all over the world. I was exactly where I wanted to be. And, when I, and being wounded in such a way, which none of us ever expects, we're prepared to pay the ultimate sacrifice as many of my friends have, but we don't even consider being wounded. But for me, I do testify that being wounded was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because it opened my eyes to recognize how much value there is in all the people that surround me, all the people that are in my life. The rest of the sphere is made up by all of the people, uh, the businesses, the support, the volunteers, the family, your friends that got you to that point where you could actually do some ultimate good. And there's a lot of analogies and symbolism and synergy between that sphere and anything that a business wants to accomplish. We can't do anything with just individuals. You can't just have a CEO, right? You need all of these parts working together to accomplish a common good. Um, so we'll move forward into an incredible panel discussion, as I said. But for me personally, my transition uh, out of the military felt like I needed something that I could be passionate about the same way that I joined the military. I needed a business or a calling that uh, fulfilled that same mission mentality and backed by the passion that I had to ultimately serve the American people. When you talk about hiring veterans, uh, you'll hear things like leadership and teamwork. You hear those things a lot, but there's a lot to be said about leadership in followership. And that's what you get with a veteran. There's a lot to be said about teamwork uh, and the accountability, holding oneself accountable and, you know, being uh, politely holding accountable other members of your team to accomplish a goal. You might say that they're really good problem solvers, but though they might not be able to solve every problem, they'll offer a different perspective, which might shed some light on what the, the possible solution could be. Punctuality, you know that we're, all, that we're always going to be on time, but we also are backed by the integrity to know that if we're not going to be there, if we're not going to show up, if we're not going to be able to meet a deadline, we're going to be forthcoming and let you know that we may be a little late. Uh, volunteering, right? We're, we're, we volunteer to join the service, uh, but we also have so many reps in the military of being voluntold to do things. So we are uh, for, we have so many reps and being willing participants to uh, answer the call to whatever is being asked of us by our boss, our community uh, and our businesses. So how do you uh, attract a veteran? How do you keep a veteran? You ensure that we know that our portion, our contribution to the overall mission is so closely um, so closely tied to mission success 
right? Uh, and that our mission, our company is passionate about uh, positively impacting those that we serve, uh, both inside our organizations and around our nation. So I think Rochelle's here to give me the wrap it up sign. <laughs> Actually, before before you wrap it up, um, would you share with our viewers today the flag that's behind you? Because I know that that has a really important message and story for you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so the flag behind us is uh, not just the American flag, but it was waving over the operations center at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. And on the day that I was wounded, uh, it was possible that I would lose my life. They lowered the flag and they folded it and they kept it. And when my team redeployed back from Afghanistan, everybody signed the flag, signed mementos. Uh, they, they framed it here with a lot of a lot of keepsakes on it as well and presented it to me whenever I was medically retired from the military two years later. Obviously, it's an incredible uh, piece of cloth, uh, incredible memento that I'll always cherish, even more so because two of the people that signed this flag uh, would later be killed in combat uh, in Afghanistan. So, um, you know, just speaks to the the amount of, of passion that that you're going to get from a veteran, right? I mean, a veteran as well as, and we'll hear more about it here, but veteran spouses as well, such as you, Rochelle, because as I mentioned, we are the tip of the spear or so we're made to believe we are, right? But I know that I can't do anything without the rest of that spear. And you, uh, Rochelle, represent all the military spouses that make up so much of the driving force that allows people that are on the front lines or maybe not just deploying or sacrificing so much you represent all of the spouses that make it possible for us to do so so well, thank, thank you for your sacrifice and for everything you've done and continue to do well th likewise thank you for yours as well i think you're an incredible human being i am so honored to know you thank you for your service the sacrifice that you made and certainly for um being here today. I, I know that you have inspired uh, companies that are watching and certainly inspire me. Um, stick around. We don't want you to, we don't want you to, we don't want you to leave. Um, we are going to turn our attention over to our panel uh, that is here with us to talk about the value and benefit of hiring military connected talent. Johnny so eloquently mentioned that not only are we talking, of course, about veterans, uh, service members, members of the Guard and the Reserve, wounded warriors, but we're certainly also talking about military spouses. So um, let me introduce our panel uh, to you all. First up, hi, Sarah. We've got Sarah joining us from LinkedIn. Um, Sarah uh, was the um, head of LinkedIn's military and veteran program for a number of years. She was recently promoted into a new role as chief of staff. And so we're very honored to have her with us. Also, um, we've got Roy Lopez from USAA. Go USAA. Roy is the diversity and talent management advisor with USAA and also a veteran. Last but certainly not least, we've got Brian Wiggins, um, leader in supplier diversity uh, in the Global Procurement Services uh, Department or part of Cisco. Thank, thank you, all three of you, for being here. Um, Let's dig right in. Um, Sarah, I'm going to start with you. You know, one of the things that I often hear employers talk about in terms of roadblocks when it comes to hiring, specifically from the veteran community, is really um, struggling to understand their transferable skill set. Johnny did a nice job of listing some of those transferable skills. And I'm curious for you and for your team at LinkedIn, what is the number one skill you hire military talent for at LinkedIn? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I think we oftentimes think of skills as you have like hard skills and soft skills. But one of the things that we've been so thoughtful about is the skill of curiosity. And the reason I say that is for three reasons. Um, one is that, you know, as you transition, there's so much you've learned. But in making that first step, your career will transform into a jungle gym, much like it did in the military. It's less linear. You're gonna pop around and experience different things. You're gonna learn what you like and what you don't like. 
And as a result of that, you're going to need to be really curious mm -hmm. about continuing to grow and learn and innovate and transform yourself as a post-military veteran or spouse that is looking for that next play. Um, the other reason is we pivoted more towards a skills-based hiring. Um, call that the result of the pandemic. There's more hybrid remote work. But I've seen a lot of companies, rather than looking straight at degree or purely qualifications, there's this really innovative approach to really looking at skills-based hiring. And I think being curious helps shine light on, you know, continuing to amplify the skills that you have, both from your military experience, volunteer experience, or other things that you're involved in. And then the other reason is people don't stay in jobs for long tenors of time from the time they transition until retirement. People are moving every two to three years. And so I think you have to continue to learn and explore both self-exploration. The job market is continuing to pivot and the skills needed are also going to continue to pivot. And so curiosity will help you stay relevant. And so those are some of the things where I think curiosity is just so important as you think about continuing to lean in, have a growth mindset and learn at every step of your transition. And you can do that through networking, asking for help, setting up informationals. There's just so much online learning and so many people that are here to help. And I think being curious and having that mindset will really pay itself forward. Hey, hey Rochelle, uh, this is Roy. I, I'd love to touch a little bit on that. Obviously, I work for USA and USA is known within the military community as an insurance provider and a bank. So I get this question all the time as to, hey, I don't know anything about a bank or I've never worked in an insurance company. Obviously, as veterans, we, we probably never have. Uh, but I like to stress out that USA is a large organization with a lot of elements within it. Uh, so believe it or not, we hire a lot of individuals that don't have insurance and banking experience, such as myself. Um, we we have other other skills that we bring to an organization. So over the last few years, we've had some significant increases in a lot of our roles, uh, specifically around those in project management and all the related roles around that. Uh, our anti money laundering investigations and uh, and analysis around those roles have been pretty 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 growth minded over the last few years. Um, and then, of course, you know, believe it or not, we are a heavily focused IT organization as all our services and products are provided over a dot com or on a on a on a, on a mobile device. Uh, so we have a lot of technical roles that are, are a perfect fit for those that come from that skill set background here at USA. So um, it's not as if if you've never had a banking license or a financial advisement license or an insurance license, uh, believe it or not, uh, many of us come to Oregon USA to provide support to those that are experts in those fields. Uh, especially veterans like ourselves. So I think that's so well well stated, Roy. Um, I want to go back to that for a second because what I hear you say is we'll train you. So what are some of those um, like peep like um, soft skills, for lack of a better word, um, that you're that you tend to look for that you're drawn to, to to veterans for when you're hiring for USAA. Well, I think one of the things that we appreciate uh, here at USA is that we're mission focused. Uh, the mission of USA is pretty well known to all employees at USA, and we're driven to that single mission. Most veterans and military spouses from the military community have that same mindset where what, I'm, what am I doing today that's going to help the overall mission of the organization? Um, and, and I think that that's strong. You know, the passion for who we provide service for. I myself have been a member for USA for a number of years. All my friends and family are USA members. So it's not as even if I'm going to work. I'm just doing what I do for my family. I'm continuing service. It's just instead of serving my nation, I'm serving those that serve our nation. And, and I think that's that's a heavy focus here at USA. Uh, so we really do appreciate those that come here with a, a team mindset that are, are, are willing to learn, that have the learning agility that we bring from the military community uh, mm -hmm. and really focus on our mission here, which is serving our own membership. So curiosity, having a growth mindset, um, willing to kind of, you know, lean outside your comfort zone a little bit, leadership, and that mission first mentality or selflessness. I think all those are, are excellent points. Um, I, Brian, I want to switch gears. I want to I want to come over to you. Um, of course, Cisco has a long standing history of supporting the military community, which we love. What unique value and benefit uh, do you find that veterans and military spouses bring to Cisco? And what is one thing you would want an employer watching today to know about the impact that those folks have had on your organization? Oh, 
Oh, I think you just need to drop off mute. Sorry, this is a whole, th this is like actually kind of a hard question to answer. And I, I you know, it's very interesting that, that um, you know, I, you, you roll around like, you know, specifically in the areas where I look, where we try to match for contingent labor with Cisco, right? Because supplier diversity is about, a lot, there's a lot of contingent, uh, uh, contingent labor that Cisco spends money on. And where do military owned, you know, veteran owned companies and people that hire a lot of veterans and veteran spouses, like where do they, where, where do we value prop that? Because we tend to look at both supplier diversity, the ownership of the company, but contingent workforce diversity, the makeup of their workforce, right? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And Deco reports their, your workforce diversity to us every year, right? Content for, for your contingent workforce. So I, I think there are hard, hard, um, skills that are difficult to identify that veteran communities do have. And I think when you get into the areas of, you know, things like I would say uh, security clearance and facility clearance, there's a clear advantage with veterans that already, you know, have clearances if identified and, and sort of managed as, as, as a talent pool in a proper way that really bring a tangible, you know, something that's actually really hard to get. Um, and, 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 and pretty and a pretty hot, a pretty hot area that, that are hard to fill. I think, too, like when you're getting veterans out of coming soon out of service or military spouses for whom sometimes employment in sort of this in the pre virtual work world actually had very big structural challenges to hiring at times. Mm -hmm. There's a loyalty there. And, and I think it's really twofold. I think, number one you know, people, those of us that, that, that served, I mean, you know, I won't tell you every day I had in the army was great, but there was a certain, you know, loyalty that, that, that you see. And when you step out and it's a little bit of, a bit of insecurity, there is a loyalty to that employer. There is a loyalty that probably is a little less common and runs a little bit at, at odds with what Sarah was saying with it. You know, they're going to, you know, they're going to have different employers every year and uh, not every year, but, but much more turnover than say my dad's generation did. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is the sense of community. And, and, and for us, it like went from having like a Guillermo Diaz for years, our CIO, who was a very visible veteran and a visible presence in the veteran community. You know, we sit and I sit in Raleigh, North Carolina. So, you know, we probably have, we don't probably, we have the strongest veterans, you know, uh, employee resource group at Cisco, yeah. which is a very volunteer mindset and exactly a lot of the stuff that Johnny was talking about before. So I, I think the sense of community and the sense of sort of having people that care that, you know, somebody kind of you know, sort of pay it forward. Somebody kind of help me. I turn around and try to help somebody, you know, try to just to understand how to, how to, guide and uh, uh, I guess how to apply the skills and, and knowledge and 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 sort of character traits that we tend to see in that community. Um, I, it's it's really enormous. And I think what it mobilizes is that it's not just the veterans. It's not just the spouses. It's the people that are connected to those people. Like in our ERO, we've got parents of veterans. We've got, you know, across the board and children of veterans and people that never serve as part of our veterans ERO because they care. Mm. And I think it does sort of mobilize in a way that 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 sometimes our things get so commoditized, it kind of brings a little bit of the passion back in. Yeah. I, the one thing I would say, and I, I have to tell you, I, I, I'm I'm a I'm a bit of an improviser, but I will tell you this: like listening to Johnny today always reminds me that. You know, I, I was a Gulf War veteran. You know, I I spent deployed to you know, was in South Korea for a year, and, and you know, spent four years at Bragg. And but I got nothing on this guy. I mean, I mean, <laughs> you listen to him and his story and the character and the 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 message and the positive yeah. positive message that he takes out of a situation that is really hard for most, for even, you know, even other veterans to really to understand. Mm -hmm. um, there is a groundedness mm. well to most people that have served that really serves you well as an employer and serves you well as a, as a, as a person, as a holistic person, a part of your community. And, you know, I, I, I tend to joke with my, my brother-in-law always would thank his dad and me on uh, on veterans day and and he was 18 years old ki kid 
in the Battle of the Bulge. I got nothing on him either, you know, and it's like so so there's always there's veterans and there's veterans. But I do think there's a grounded nature and an understanding of 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 what tough times really are and what challenges really are and sort of applying that in a way that when stuff has to be delivered, it gets delivered. And when you need a little bit of sort of let's just kind of keep it real what we're talking about, nobody's going to die here. Um, it's 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 a real balance that I think make it like helps your company with people of of terrific capability and and terrific character. Well said, Brian. Well said. Speaking of challenge, um, Roy, you I've seen so so much of the great advice that you've given um, online and in some speeches you've given specifically to transitioning service members because it can be a challenge. You heard Johnny say that he had. Um, he had a, 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 a unique, certainly, um, a positive experience with his transition. Not everybody else is that fortunate. Um, and so I've seen the advice you've given service members, but what specific advice would you give an employer? Um, what should they consider when they're interviewing specifically a service member getting out of the military? So that fresh, that very green transitioning service member, what would, what would you say, Roy, to that employer? Wow, Rochelle, thank you so much. That, that's a great question. Simply because obviously that's the first step, you know, hiring them, going through the selection process and, and, and securing that great talent that comes from our military community. But what do you do then? And I think it's critical that you be ready, be military ready. Being here will classify you as military friendly, like you're open to that talent. But once you've secured that talent, it's important that you're military ready. And how do you do that? There's, there's a couple of different things and we can go on and on about that. But one of those things to do is just as a culture, you need to be with that employee for the long haul. You know, the transition takes time beyond the normal hiring process. For, for veterans, the normal onboarding, you know, is, is lengthy. You know, whereas with normal onboarding, you know, that, that's, that's, you know, you, you can review that over a, a few instances and it's not, it's, it's not going to work out the same way. Uh, so simply being with that veteran or the, or, or the military spouse even, uh, they should review their onboarding plan and include other touch points, you know, and potentially over a long term, have an onboarding plan that includes connections with other veterans, perhaps within their organization and understand. Uh, and this is important that experience coming directly from the military. It's not as if you just take the uniform off and you go to work. It's not I'm going to go work for a different company. It's a complete different mindset and culture and how we work. Uh, so it's just a little bit more in depth. And sometimes it can be something as minor as, you know, what we would consider pretty extreme. If you recall back in our military days when we wore the uniform, if you were five minutes late for a meeting, you know, that was the end of the world. That, the whole day was about that. You know, it was a tremendous sign of disrespect and unprofessionalism. Whereas in the civilian world, that, that happens. We, we get that, you know. Um, so USA, for example, we have a 12-month program called Vets Lead or Veterans Transition Development Program. And this allows for discovery of the transition, not just to being a USA employee, but being a better civilian. And, and that's critical. Uh, so we use that program along with other efforts and we mitigate some of these challenges with newly transitioning veterans and, and bringing their best self to the organization. Uh, much of this activity is managed or at least heavily relied upon on our own veteran resource group. I know Brian mentioned Cisco's, you know, uh, we have our own and much of that activity uh, through them uh, is, is critical. So if an employer doesn't have a resource group specifically for veterans, I highly encourage them to allow the veterans to create their resource group and then advise organizational leadership to support and advocate for this resource group. This allows organizations that are transitioning into a more military ready organization to leverage the diverse military experience that they already have within the organization and anybody else coming in. And like Brian mentioned, you know, that could be the spouse, the children, the parents, grandparents, uncles, or just somebody that's really passionate about the community. Um, and, and this helps foster an appreciation, understanding and respect for the military culture that, that they're bringing in. And it's a positive culture. But just understand that they're going to come from a different place uh, rather than just from one civilian organization to a civilian organization. They have a lot to relearn. Uh, and we as organizations have a responsibility to help bring that bring that best person that we possibly could to an organization. So it's hard. It's a long journey, but we can but everybody can do it. And we have all the resources here to help out. Those are some really, really important tips that you laid out there. In fact, I was going to go over a couple of those things that you said, which now I don't have to because <laughs> you did it for me, Roy, so eloquently. I, I, I love it. Um, I saw that my friend John Buckley. Hi, John. Hi, Rochelle. How are you? Us. 
I'm so good, John. Thank you so much for being here. Happy National Hire Veteran Day. Uh, John's with Coke Industries and is also a veteran. Um, this is timely. I have our, our last panel question, John, is actually for you. And that is around the issue of underemployment. And I think some of the employers that are here today might actually be surprised to learn that underemployment is actually as big of an issue for veterans as it is. It's certainly a huge issue for us in the military spouse community. Our underemployment rate hovers around 63%, which is jaw dropping. But I know that this is an issue that you feel passionately about and that you've really done a good job of combating it, Coke. Tell us a little bit about what you are doing there. I, I think, Rochelle, the, the first thing to understand uh, before you can come up with any solutions is what is the cause of this underemployment? And you, you've got to define the problem first. And what we discovered here at Coke Industries is that underemployment is often caused because of the timeline that transitioning military veterans have to undergo. And what I mean by that is they know when Uncle Sam stops paying them. And they don't understand necessarily the entire selection process in depth. So, so they wait until the last minute to apply for a job. And they don't do the preparatory work to, that should go into it. And so what ends up happening is they just jump at the first job that comes their way because they know Uncle Sam's going to stop paying them. So that's a big challenge. Well, what can a company do to help that? Well, what we do at Coke Industries is we try to engage the military veteran, the transitioning service member, the military spouse at an earlier point in their in their transition. So we try to engage them. We try to coach them. We mentor them. We orient them on relevant jobs. So we do a lot of work up front to enable them to find the right job and then apply for it in a timely manner. And then that takes us engaging our recruiters, our hiring managers, and informing and educating them on the timeline. Sometimes we might interject ourselves and say, hey, I know you're going to take 90 days you know, before you hire somebody, but, but this person is running out of time. Can you really evaluate their skills and see if you can expedite the decision? So we'll, we'll engage the hiring managers as well. So that's the first part of the challenge is getting them to apply to the right job at the right time so that they're not under that duress of time constraint. Hmm. The second thing that we try to do, and this is really consistent with Coke Industries, regardless of whether or not you're a veteran, this, this is for all employees. We encourage self-actualization. So we want that employee to proactively seek the next job, proactively seek growth and advancement opportunities. But more importantly, we have the hiring managers or now the supervisors who are deeply involved in their uh, direct reports and actually encouraging them to seek those, um, th those advancement and growth opportunities. I'll tell you a simple story. Uh, a gentleman who we hired, um, he was actually 20 plus years in the Army and the Coast Guard, and he came to me after about a year and he was like really happy. He says, oh my gosh, I got a pay raise. I got a bonus. I really didn't expect this so quickly. And I said, you know, this is really because of you. You know, a lot of veterans do that because of their performance, all the reasons that Brian covered and Roy covered as well. So about six weeks later, I see him and he's like really down. I'm like, what happened? You know, did you lose your cat or something like that? And he was like, no, I found my my dream job and it's over at another Coke company. And I'm like, OK, well, go sit down with your hiring manager, your supervisor now and and discuss this with him. And so that's exactly, you know, loyalty. I think the word was used out there. Mm -hmm. Loyalty is something that gets in our way because we really have, I mean, that's a strength. That's a strong virtue that we carry, but it's not relevant anymore in the private sector. Now you've got to think of yourself and the company is encouraging you. So I said, get rid of loyalty, go for the job. He sat down with his hiring manager or the supervisor and the supervisor actually picked up the call and, and called his, his counterpart, learned more about the job, sold uh, the hiring manager on his, his direct report. And now we've got another happy veteran. Um, and we do that all the time. So we, we, we try to quickly identify their strengths and weaknesses, encourage them to be proactive about looking for their jobs. We encourage them to self-actualize, and then we encourage that, uh, you know, finding that job. We actually created a, a, another 
section of our department here where that's that's what this entire group does. They look for encouraging and enabling people to find the right job. And that means advancement and growth. And that really gets rid of the underemployment issues. Um, I think those are some fantastic tips and, and fantastic feedback, John. Um, I want to thank all of you um, on the panel today. Thank you so much for spending time and for sharing your feedback. One of the things I, I think I heard, if I can summarize, is and we certainly believe this across the ADECO group, that is when you hire for attitude, you can train for skill. Um, and that's certainly true for, um, for military connected talent. So that would be one takeaway that I would want employers today watching uh, is, to remember, uh, is to remember that. Um, we are gonna switch gears just a little bit. Um, we heard uh, a couple of our last panelists talk about the uh, importance of setting up uh, employee resource groups or network groups and retention. Um, I want to say just quickly, uh, and then we can bring on our next panel. There are, are so many important things that you need to consider when you actually start trying to find military connected talent. And the employers that I see that do this really successfully do a couple of things that are that are important. Um, they take into cons into consideration or or to in into account the entire hiring experience. So they think more holistically about it. And I mean everything from um, recruitment to the job description, to where you're finding uh, talent and certainly how to keep that talent. And the other thing that successful companies do is they make sure that they create a work, work culture that values military service, whether it's a military spouse hired at an organization or a veteran or someone continuing to serve through the Guard and Reserve, you want to make sure that you're establishing a culture that appreciates and values, again, military service. Um, we are going to be following up after today's event um, with a hiring guide that we put out about a month and a half ago or so that goes over a lot more targeted tips around where and how to locate military connected talent. So please look at that. Um, next, what I'd like to do is bring up our last panel. Uh, this is a fine group of individuals who have joined us today from some really great companies. All veterans and military spouses joining me on the screen. Hi, guys. We've got Carrie Ann joining us uh, from the, the Military Affairs Global Team from Amazon. Carrie Ann, thank you so much for being here. Marcus Smashmit joining us from our very own LHH Recruitment Solutions. He's a training manager and Army veteran. And last but absolutely not least, one of my favorite people on the planet, Meredith Lozar. Um, the VP uh, of the military affairs team over at JP Morgan Chase and an active military spouse. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here. So um, we are going to talk about retention. So we've talked about the value and benefit of hiring military talent, talked quickly a little bit about some tips about how to find you all. And now you, we want to hear from you about ways to keep you engaged at your organization and how the nuances of being a veteran or military spouse might impact retention. I fondly say we wanna keep these folks growing, not going from our organization. So let's talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, Carrie Ann, I'm gonna start with you. As a veteran, what are you looking for from an employer when it comes to um, promoting your own professional growth and development? So as a veteran, what is it that you need and that other employers should think about when retaining veteran talent? Yeah, thank you so much. And one reason why I picked Amazon was because they have all of the above. So when I look at, as a veteran, looking at any kind of organization, one thing I love to look is if they have upskilling programs. Hmm. Do they have apprenticeship programs? Do they have military spouse fellowship programs? Do they have skill bridges? Do they offer multiple touch points? Let's say if I don't want to get into tech, but I want to get into HR, do they have multiple touch points where you can get into different industries? Um, and that's really what I look for as a veteran. One thing, and I think Roy brought it up fantastically, is uh, the difference between military friendly and military ready. Mm -hmm. Now, do they have the policies behind um, military LOAs? If you're in the reserve and the guard, are they going to support you when you get activated or need those two weeks? If you're a military spouse, do they have any kind of policies behind that to help you with your uh, transition when your spouse moves every three to four years? Are you able to keep your job? Are you able to go remote? Are there policies behind that? Um, at Amazon, 
Amazon, we have an entire pillar that is definitely selected for these kind of attrition things. And we look at these programs and we look at these issues and say, hey, where can we file policy behind it? Or what can we do through these to kind of help our military community and, you know, retain them within Amazon? Great, great point, Kyrie Ann. Um, Marcus, I'm curious if you, if there's anything you want to add there. Yeah, I love that you say that, Karen. It's so important when you are an employer to have the resources available for veterans as they come through. Uh, one thing that we're used to being in the service is continually having certifications while we're going through the military. Uh, there's different classes we have to take all the time just to keep up our skills. So for employers to even have a Excel training, right, it's just something to to continue to broaden your oh, employer's skills. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So congratulations uh, to you, Carrie Ann and Amazon for the work you're doing. Okay, Meredith, I'm going to, I'm going to move over to you. Um, you have obviously built an, well, not obviously, because not everybody on this call knows you. I'm lucky enough to know you, but you have built an amazing career as a military spouse. Um, talk to me a little bit about from the military spouse standpoint, you personally, but then also maybe just speaking to the larger military spouse community, what is it that is important to you? What is it that is important uh, to the military spouse community when it comes to retention and being able to stay with a stay with an organization? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And thank you so much for that, Rochelle. It has definitely been an adventure. This is our 11th duty station in the last 17 years. So I know that ages me, but I think it also shows that we have been incredibly portable. We've lived in the U.S. and also outside of it. So creating a career path during that time frame has been really challenging. And I think as a military spouse, I have looked for portable opportunities. I've looked for remote work opportunities. But more than that, I've looked for opportunities to grow. So how long is my runway in an organization? Is someone going to be committed to giving me exposure to other opportunities within mm -hmm. the company that I currently am staffed with? And I think that has been incredibly important. And what we've lost sight of a little bit has been how can military spouses continue to grow and lead in a remote environment. And what we found during COVID is that military spouses are the premier remote workforce and we can lead and we can also mentor others in our organization in a remote environment. So what we want to stay focused on, I think, as employers is how do we continue to create growth opportunities for military spouses when they move to that next duty station. Instead of looking at it as they might be lost to us, it's actually how can I hang on to this incredible talent? And I know at J.P. Morgan Chase, we are currently very focused on that. And can we cr create a portable opportunity? So if it's not 100% remote work, is there an office nearby that we can plug you into a couple of days a week so we can continue to help you grow here at the firm when you move on to that next duty station? And I think COVID has really given us so much great opportunity to do that for military spouses. Well said. I, I would add to that, Meredith. You know, um, and you know, you know this because we talk about this. Not not only exposure to other job opportunities, but just exposure for the individual, yeah. for the military spouse. You know, the importance of having a sponsor or a mentor in, in an organization that can help shed some light on the great work that that military spouse is doing so that it's recognized by others. I think that, especially when you're working remotely, that that that, that that's really important. Um, and I know that 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 JPMC does a good does a good job of that too. Okay, I want to um, move back over to you, Marcus, if you don't mind. Um, I think that you have an interesting story. Um, in so many of our veterans, of course, transitioned out of the service during COVID, you being one of them, um, Marcus. Um, talk a little bit about your transition out of the military uh, during COVID, moving into a remote, uh, Meredith talk just touched on this too, moving into a remote or virtual work environment. Um, what do employers need to know or need to consider or thinking about when they are interviewing and hiring veterans coming out of the workforce and going straight into a virtual job, maybe a, a working in an environment that they've never worked in before? Yeah, such a good question and perfect topic for what we're going through right now, Rochelle. Um, I, I did, I transitioned out February 7th of 2020, started working in my civilian role uh, March 3rd, two weeks later, the pandemic happened. 
and we're all home working remote. And this is a new world. If you really think about what veterans are coming from, we are used to being close quarters with our fellow service members all day, every day. From 6 a.m. in the morning for PT all the way until night, if, you, if you're a single soldier living in the barracks, I mean, you're stuck with them all the time. <laughs> so uh, it, it's uh, it's an interesting when you have to now move into this remote world where you're sitting in front of a computer screen like we are now. So um, I'll start with saying to all of our employers out there is get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Because that's the world we're in now. And, and, and really continue to promote a, a workforce, a culture of inclusion. Uh, think about uh, what now they, veterans are having to go through of talking to someone on a video stream. Um, while phone calls are better than emails, a video call is a game changer because it's now putting a face to the name, right? right. Um, and, and, then, and really think about the mission. We're, we're trained as service members to complete the mission, right? We get the objective and we have to go from A to Z. So as an employer, I know it sounds weird to think of it as a mission, but look at it as the objective. What is the veteran's objective when they come start working in your workforce? What do you want them to get to? Because veteran service members are trained to make it to the end, right? And so come up with those resources, let them know, have an open dialogue of what you're expecting and what you want to see for them when as they cross the, the, the finish line and continue just to share and have that open dialogue of what's next for them, right? We uh, Again, service members are constantly thinking about climbing the ladder, adding another rank to our chest, right? And, and so think about that as you are talking uh, to your service members, your veterans on one-on-ones, what's next for you? What do you want to do next? And I'll say that uh, LHH Equipment Solutions, I know all the tag, uh, the ADECO group has done such an amazing job. Uh, my boss continues to ask us every single day, what do you want to do next? As much as he wants to hang on to us for the rest of our lives, he's always asking us, what do you want to do next, right? So continue that conversation um, through this amazing world of remote. <laughs> yeah, keeping, keeping connected, keeping that yeah. sense of community going. Yeah, I think, I think that's probably true for all job seekers, but especially when you're coming from a, a, the type of culture that, that service members come from where they are to get together and connected um, so much. So I think, I think that that's well said. Um, you all, I cannot believe it, but we are actually um, up on our time. And I know that, that we could continue this conversation for another hour, actually the rest of the day <laughs> for, for that matter. And there's actually nothing I would love to do more. Um, but I think that all the folks that are joining us today probably have to get back to their day, their days too. Thank you, each and every one of you, uh, as my boss would say, for voting with your time to be here, to share your personal stories, to share your company's stories and commitment to hiring military connected talent. And to all of you who joined us today, thank you so much for celebrating National Hire a Veteran Day with us. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we will be sure to follow up with you. Um, we will have a recording of this event. Also, if you remember when we were advertising this event, we promised that someone that attended today's event would be uh, in the chance to win a free pair of AirPods. So we will be announcing that within the hour. We'll be randomly selecting a winner. None of my panelists get that, by the way. Sorry, you're 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 out of the <laughs> you're out of the ruffle. Um, but the attendees that were here today are certainly in it. Thank you again so much for everyone's time. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thanks guys. Thank you.